So I'm going to talk about uh, some work that, that, uh, that, that we have done in the context of uh, not only the ENCODE, um, uh, the main ENCODE project, but also this parallel mouse ENCODE project. And I think many of you are uh, uh, interested in mouse and have worked with, uh, with the mouse data. And there's really a, a, a very tremendous resource out there that has been created and, and is being added to. Um, I, I'm going to start out just with just a general background um, uh, because I've been hit up with a, a few questions about uh, the relationship of um, regulatory DNA, DNA hypersensitive sites, et cetera. So just give a, a brief background on the, on the situation currently with the human genome uh, and then go into a um, uh, comparison between the human and mouse genome. So um, the focus of the, uh, of the talk is going to be uh, uh, these regions of the genome, which I'm generically going to refer to as, as regulatory DNA, they're, they're, they're generally short regions, a couple of hundred base pairs to which transcription factors uh, are complexed, and they encode all kinds of um, interesting activities, uh, which we sort of encompass under the broader rubric of functional elements. Um, Part of the difficulty here that you know, some of you may have sensed in, in this meeting and actually was referred to directly um, by a couple of the prior speakers uh, is, is the fact that we, that we tend to uh, lump these, um, these regions into a few categories. I mean, here we have our little uh, uh, kindergarten vocabulary that we inherited from the 1980s to describe them, you know, promoters, enhancers, silencers, insulators. Uh, and of course, that is, et cetera is not very big. It's only maybe one or two other things. Um, and, and this is a, an enormous challenge right now is, is sort of understanding exactly what uh, all these elements do. So um, in, in a broader effort uh, to map human regulatory DNA, you've seen uh, many different uh, modalities for mapping and defining where the regions are and then annotating various properties of them. Um, a, a very core property of these regions, no matter what they actually do, um, is related to the binding of transcription factors. Um, and, and of course, these factors uh, cause a change in the chromatin structure. They can recruit other modalities that can put modifications on the neighboring histones, et cetera. But really, the cardinal property of these regions, no matter what they do, is that they have this altered chromatin structure that's accessible to nucleases. And, and the classic one here is, uh, is DNase 1. So if you put DNase 1 in the, in the nucleus of a cell, um, uh, essentially very selectively cleaves the genome in these regions. In other words, hundreds fold more frequently than even the flanking regions. And, and what this does is releases little tiny fragments of DNA. Um, and you can capture these uh, just by a size fractionation, sequence them, map them to the genome. Um, and, and if you go to any region here uh, and, and start plotting what these sequences look like after you sequence uh, 30 or 40 million reads genome-wide, this is what you get. And um, these, uh, the, these peaks, this is what you see in the browser. Um, uh, these little peaks are the DNA hypersensitive sites in the case of this, uh, these assays. Generically, all of these uh, uh, peaks here I'm going to refer to as the regulatory DNA compartment. And uh, without going too much into this until later, inside these peaks, so we're just looking at the density of cleavage, if you sequence more and more and more, um, you can actually uh, start to see the structure of where these proteins are. Um, and uh, this is illustrated here just by depth of sequencing. This is where the proteins recognize, and you can sort of see now the appearance of, uh, oops, sorry, of um, uh, the transcription factor footprints where they're sitting on the genome. And, and these will come around later. Um, and, and more broadly, then, applying this across uh, various cell types, um, you can map. Uh, the promoters, the enhancers, and sort of a good number to keep in your head is that roughly, there's roughly um, a, a range of about 100,000 to 250,000 DNA hypersensitive sites that you'll detect in any given cell type. Um, so it's, you know, on average, maybe about 150,000 elements, and that translates to about 1% uh, about of the genome that's in that state. Um, there's a huge amount of these data. You've seen various uh, pieces of them uh, in, in, in prior presentations. Um, it, it collectively now, uh, if you combine the ENCODE data, the data from the roadmap, uh, and, and actually there were some questions around this I overheard in uh, one of the breaks, that, that uh, eventually all of the data from the roadmap is also uh, being consolidated with, uh, with ENCODE as well to facilitate access, because, you know, many of you just want to go just say, I want this tissue, this cell type for a data type, and so it'll all eventually um, uh, be together. Uh, but in the case of the DNA's one data, there's, there's over 400 
uh, cell and tissue types and, and also developmental states um, uh, and, and virtually all of it from uh, primary cells and tissues. So just to put some numbers on this, kind of where things stand, um, currently it looks like the human genome encodes at least 4 million DNA hypersensitive sites. Um, virtually all of these show some degree of uh, tissue or lineage selectivity, some of them uh, uh, fairly extreme. Um, uh, virtually the, the vast majority of these elements are in the distal non-promoter compartment. That still leaves a lot in the promoter compartment. So, you know, Tom was talking about the sort of 50,000 annotated genes. Well, those genes have a lot of alternative promoters uh, out there as well that are, that are tissue specific. One of the things that, that it's important to keep in mind when you're looking at the DNA swan data is that you are looking here at a generic snapshot of where regulatory features are encoded in a particular cell type, but you are also looking at a compartment that has a capacity for memory in the sense that any given site that you see either is active in that cell type at that particular time or it is potentially active, it's primed for some type of activity, or it is a remnant of prior activity that exists as a, as a memory. And, and this may, uh, uh, is, is quite surprising, but it was actually a feature that was uncovered very early in the history of, uh, of chromatin regulatory DNA analysis by uh, uh, Harold Weintraub and Mark Rudine. And, and the consequence of this, uh, comp this sort of memory compartment is that you can take DNA's profiles and you can see, you know, stuff kind of turning on, off, on, on, off, et cetera. And if you take these things and you just kind of cluster them, you actually can organize cell and tissue types um, in a way that, that recapitulates the structures that we know exist and the, the fate decisions that we know were made very early in development. And so in this case, you know, for partitioning of the blood, the endothelia, et cetera, all of the information and structure in these, in these lineages here was just actually created by clustering fully differentiated cells. Um, and, and the reason of, uh, for this is that when you look forward in differentiation, so let's say if I'm going from a stem cell to a hematopoietic you know, progenitor and then on to some other hematopoietic lineages, there are two things going on. First of all, the size of the DNA one landscape, the number of hypersensitive sites contracts as you're moving forward. Um, and, and so that's kind of the size of these circles. And the second thing is that there is this carryover or persistence of, of information. And so if we kind of map this out a little bit different way in a few lineages, imagine you're starting out here with a, with a compartment in embryonic stem cells. Um, this is sort of the size of the hypersensitive site landscape. By the time you're at a hematopoietic progenitor, uh, you have shrunk this down. So there's about 250,000 sites here. There's about 140,000 or so sites here. Uh, and at this point, about 40% of them are, are persistent or shared with, with ESLs. And there's a bunch of things that are new. And then this happens all over again as you differentiate to each lineage. So here's about 100,000 sites in each of these differentiated cells. And about a third of them are are persistent or shared with ES cells. Another bunch is persistent or shared with the progenitors. Uh, and then there's this compartment of about 50%, but it's a different 50% in each of these cell types, is the one that's unique to that terminal branch. And so what that means is, and we've done this sort of analysis now in, in several other systems, including dynamically differentiating systems like ES cells. And, and so the numbers to keep in mind is that about a third of the landscape that you see in fully differentiated cells is persistent from ES cells and is not associated with active gene expression. And then, but if you count in the progenitors, we're estimating that another chunk, so roughly half of the compartment that's there is there for, it's persistent, it's some type of memory function, it's got a, a, a select group of transcription factors in, in general, it's a fairly big group, but, but that are occupying it. Um, and, and this leads, so it means that the, that the TNAs1 landscape, when you look at it, it's not all just enhancers, it's a complex mix of, uh, of cell states and a much more rich um, uh, uh, compartment than just what's actively propagating expression at that time in that, in that tissue. Okay. Um, so there are also uh, ways that we can now connect about a million of these four million elements uh, with likely target genes by watching their coactivation with 
uh, a target genes promoter over, uh, over hundreds of cell types. Um, and, and, and finally, it's, it's worth emphasizing the point that individual cell types that we have looked at, and, and the more you can parse things, the more this is the case, every individual cell type has hundreds to thousands of these elements that are, appear to be completely unique for that cell type. And as we complete the map, that number may shrink a little bit, but it's not gonna get below hundreds, uh, uh, certainly, uh, or, or potentially even low thousands for in individual cell types. Okay, so going within those hypersensitive sites, our calculations now are that the genome encodes at least 20 million regulatory factor recognition sites. Um, that in each cell type, there's roughly on the order of two to five million transcription factor footprints that we can detect by genomic footprinting if we uh, sequence to, to, to completion. Um, and that the average cell type uses a recognition lexicon of somewhere between two or 300 words. And you get this by mining all of those footprints and then collapsing it and find that there's this lexicon of somewhere between two and 300 motifs. Um, and then finally, in terms of the global lexicon uh, for, for recognition sites for TFs, we, meaning the community, I think are now fairly rapidly closing in on a complete recognition lexicon from combining a variety of technologies uh, uh, to get there. I was just at a, at a meeting uh, last week where, uh, where it, there's a, was an update on this and there's quite a lot of activity and that's gonna, I think, uh, greatly improve. It can be immediately imported into tools from ENCODE to, to improve annotations of the genome. But coming back to sort of the general landscape that's out there, four million sites, roughly 150,000, you know, uh, combinatorially in any, any given cell type, but the big problem is that we have very little idea what most of these sites do. Um, you know, it, it's definitely not just enhancers, and I think we're sort of doing ourselves a disservice by using that word and thinking about everything as enhancers, because really I think it's a case that most regulatory regions are likely to encode novel and complex activities that are going to take some time to sort out. So, you know, for example, we stumbled into a, a, a set of elements, there's, I don't know, 30, 40,000 of these in the genome, and what they do is they sort of park themselves near or partly on exons and loop them to the promoter region where they seem to be uh, uh, modulating rates of alternative splicing. So that's just an example of a complex activity, but there are likely many to be sorted out uh, uh, as we go forward. Um, and finally, with, with respect to the, the transcription factor landscape, the fundamental challenge, I think, is becoming more clear that every regulatory region is built differently and every transcription factor has to do its job in its local context with local partners in its local chromatid environment. Uh, and, 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 and the chromatid environment is incredibly important um, uh, in that, you know, I think that there's, as we understand that better, there's a widening discrepancy between what's actually going on in the genome and what you can sort of recreate in, in artificial assays. So now I want to turn to the, the question of where did this all come from and, and where did, you know, the, how did the regulatory genome arise? And I'll divide the rest of the talk into, into two parts. The first part I'll talk about sort of mouse and human regulatory regions defined by DNA hypersensitive sites and, and a bit about the evolutionary dynamics uh, shaping that landscape. And in the second part, I'll talk about uh, transcription factors and networks and particularly looking at the relationship between conservation of trans versus cis regulatory activity. So as I mentioned, there has, uh, uh, in, in the mouse encode project, um, there's been a systematic effort ongoing now to, to define uh, mouse regulatory DNA using various modalities and with the hypersensitive sites um, uh, at, at the time of some publications last year, actually the time I made this slide, there were 44 cells and tissues. I think that's up into the 50s and 60s and it's gonna, it's gonna climb higher uh, and get even more, more comprehensive uh, and more finely detailed. But what I'll talk today are about, uh, about 1.3 million distinct sites that you can map across uh, 44 cells and tissues. Again, we're looking at an average of about 150,000 uh, uh, DHSs per cell type. And I'll compare this with a set of um, around 3 million hypersensitive sites from 230 uh, human cell and tissue types that we've integrated. So, but if you do this and you take the 
human sequences, the mouse sequences, and you align uh, uh, everything. So you align the mouse sequence to the human, um, and basically you get sort of a picture where you can, uh, for a given um, uh, orthologous region, you can identify uh, both uh, species-specific hypersensitive sites uh, and ones that are shared between uh, between species. Um, and uh, there, there are various ways to do these alignments to make absolutely sure by, by sort of doing mutual cross alignments, et cetera, that you're dealing with the, the same pieces of DNA. But, but very globally, the picture you get is, is this, is that of this pool of about 1.3 million uh, DHSs, um, around 40% of them do not align to the human genome. Okay, so this is something that is specific to mouse. And these are not throwaway elements. They cluster all around super important mouse genes. They turn on and off with them. They, they have all the properties uh, of, 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 uh, of mouse regulatory elements. And in fact, many of them are uh, elements that people have studied in mouse that just don't align with the human genome. Um, and you have two other compartments here. So one of them here in the, the yellow are sites that align to the human genome and are also hypersensitive sites in, one, in some human tissue out there. Um, and then there's this group of about 24% uh, uh, that align to the human genome but are not hypersensitive in any tissue that we have seen so far. So that's, they're, they're, given the fact that that's a larger space, they potentially have been evolutionarily extinguished. So on the one hand, we can look directly at the mouse, but of course we can take these sequences and align them across uh, all other animals. And, and what you find here is sort of a general picture where we have, this is the, the, the percentage of the mouse hypersensitive sites that are, um, uh, that are kind of aligning. Uh, and then here's sort of the, the distant, the evolutionary, uh, or, or um, uh, the, the, the evolutionary distance. And sort of mapping this on here, what you basically get is that uh, sort of 75% of the, of, the, of the DHS landscape is, uh, is, res is restricted to, um, uh, to placental animals. Um, and, and then if we map in now sort of this stuff here that's kind of shared with, uh, you know, shared with human, um, you, you find that there is uh, this 50% of the non-aligning stuff is, uh, is, is restricted to, to murids. Here's the stuff that, that aligns up to human. And, and basically, what, what you find is that the vast majority of mouse and human regulatory DNA is specific to uh, placental animals, although even in there, there has been uh, a, a fairly tremendous rearranging of the, of the furniture. And so this appears, this kind of rearranging appears to under, to, uh, uh, there's sort of two big picture principles that emerge from this. One of them is that there appears to be um, extensive functional repurposing of DNA. And, and by the way, what I mean by that is that you have a situation where if you look at this, these 1.3 million sites in the mouse, um, and then you look at the one, so this is the fraction here that aligned this 40% that, or, or whatever, the, the, sorry, this, uh, this chunk of about 33% that, uh, that maps the human and is hypersensitive in some tissue. About 21, so this chunk right here in red, 21% overall, but this chunk here is hypersensitive in the same tissue orthologously that it is in human and mouse. And this other chunk here has switched tissues. So for example, it's the case where, you know, these are, are kind of orthologous elements. So let's say here it's in the mouse and in the human, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's both in muscle, which is an orange, and this is a, a mouse brain element, also on a brain in human, and it maybe has acquired expression in muscle. But, but this green chunk corresponds to things which are on in one tissue type in the mouse, and then they're a completely different one uh, uh, in, in, in the human. And, and this is, so this appears to be a fairly frequent and prevalent phenomenon that nature can kind of rearrange that, uh, uh, that the, the furniture there pretty, pretty easily. And, and if you look inside these guys, uh, what you find is that the mechanism of this is, is fairly straightforward because in, in all of these cases, there has been a turnover of the, uh, of the binding sites. So you have some sites that are, that are conserved um, and then uh, basically you have other sites where, where there are novel binding sites that turn up. Um, and so if, again, if you look in this global compartment of things that are hypersensitive in the, in the human, um, uh, only this fraction right here have a conserved transcription factor binding site. Um, and there's actually a whole bunch of them that uh, remarkably are in the same location 
in the genome. And we know that because we can align the DNA around there, but there has been such extensive switching around of the binding sites that there's basically no conservation uh, uh, of, of, uh, of the recognition sequence, that you could have turned over the entire thing. And, and, and if somebody asks how that could happen, I can answer that a little bit uh, later because it's sort of a biophysical playground there as well. Um, and, and, and certainly the conserved binding sites are enriched in the sites that have conserved activity. So basically, again, just to kind of you know, throw some numbers here, looking at the entirety of the mouse landscape, you've got 21% of that landscape that's shared with a corresponding orthologous human tissue, and 11% has a conserved binding site in it somewhere. Now, that's a fair amount of, of divergence. And you know, given all of this divergence in the regulatory landscapes, you can basically ask, what is maintaining functional conservation in, in mouse and human? I mean, mice and human have the same basic body plan, physiological functions, lots of other things. So what is sort of maintaining this? And, and here is one of the, uh, one view from the global landscape picture, and I'll give you another view from the, uh, from the sort of the fine landscape picture. Um, that there are, we have been treating conservation at, uh, in a very, very sequence-centric manner and looking at it at individual spots in the genome. And what that does is it basically ignores the bigger picture of what might be going on. And what we find is it's actually conservation of global regulatory content. So that if I go and look at, at uh, take mouse and humans, so I take a given cell type, I look and I take a given transcription factor and I look and say, what fraction of the hypersensitive sites in that cell type, what fraction of the real estate is, uh, is uh, devoted to recognition sites for that transcription factor? And I calculate that in the human, in the human and the mouse for every factor in two completely orthologous uh, cell types. So this is regulatory T cells in mouse and human. Each dot here is a transcription factor. And basically, it's the case that the amount of the, of the, of the um, real estate that's devoted to each trans transcription factor is the same in mouse and human. You can do this in different tissue types, uh, et, et cetera. And so despite the conser poor conservation of individual binding sites, the overall proportion of this real estate is, is nearly constant uh, between, different, uh, b between different cell types, uh, or sorry, between, uh, for any given transcription factor between two organisms. So just to recap this uh, uh, quickly, um, Regulatory DNA landscape has undergone a whole cell rewiring uh, during the mouse-human interval. Humans and mice share a core regulon that encodes cell identity and lineage programs. Um, and I didn't actually go into this, but, but that, that core set is really enriched with the lineage regulatory factors. The regulatory landscape evolution involves two basic things. One, this extensive repurposing of elements from one tissue context to another. And the second one is that there's continuous re-evolution on the same ancestral DNA uh, template. And finally, strict conservation of the proportion of regulatory DNA encoding binding sites for a transcription factor. So very quickly, I just want to walk through the uh, view from the ground up in transcription factors and networks. And so here, what we can do is push the data by a deep sequencing down to the level where we can read individual transcription factor footprints. This enabled us in, in 25 cell types to map 8.6 million uh, footprints, and so you can go in the genome and dial them up and, and see them for, for various cell types. Uh, a, a large fraction of these are very cell type selective, but overall, you have a situation where about 20%, a little bit over 20% of the footprints are conserved positionally between human uh, and mouse. And on top of that, what you have is uh, conservation of the recognition repertoires. So if we go and we mine these footprints, we derive a transcription factor lexicon just like we did for the human, and you do this and you get a set of 600 unique motif models, you can compare this, you can see which ones match databases, and you get about 240 that are not in databases, and you can compare this with the identical exercise in the human, and remarkably, these, uh, these motifs line up. So the human and the mouse uh, transcription factors, their effective recognition repertoire on the genome is practically identical. The human, the mouse has some that the human doesn't, and the human has a few that the mouse doesn't, and the mouse ones are kind of selective for, for ES cells. But in general, very strong conservation. And then if we look at the circuitry, meaning 
how transcription factors, so transcription factors are obviously wired in a big network, they control downstream genes, but one of the most vital genes that transcription factors control are other transcription factors and themselves. And you can actually map those circuits by, by going uh, 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 into uh, the, uh, data, looking at each transcription factor gene, and this is just sort of cartoon for a promoter, but just to get the idea, looking at the transcription factors that are there in footprints. You know, so these are the ones that are controlling this gene. And then this gene, of course, this transcription factor can control these other transcription factor genes. So now you've got the basis of uh, your nodes, transcription factor, an edge. It's a connection between two transcription factor genes. And, and if you iterate this over and over, you get a network. You get these big hairballs, right? But unlike the sort of normal, uh, uh, you know, hairballs, uh, these are actually, you can kind of comb through them really nicely because they contain very, very precise representations of known uh, uh, transcription factor relationships. And if you do this again in the mouse and systematically map this, you find that a large number of these transcription factor to transcription factor connections are cell selective. So that, for example, you know, in brain, this transcription factor is controlling these other genes. Uh, in, uh, let's say, in retina, the same factor is controlling part of them and, and other genes. But the really critical thing is, now what we can do is we can ask, what happened to these connections during evolution? So if I have these transcription factors here in the mouse gene and these here in the human gene, I can identify instances where, let's say in this case, the same factor is present at the same position in human and mouse. In this case, the same factor is present, but it has moved. In this case, there is a, a human-specific one, and here is a mouse-specific one. And we could look at all of these different uh, proportions. And when you do this, you find that, that there, here is this fraction that is positionally conserved, and then there is this excess of these sites where the connection has been maintained through the innovation of a brand new binding site uh, on, on the template. Um, so around this number from 20% you know, roughly goes up to uh, uh, 44, 45%. And at the level of global network architecture, looking how the network is built and how network motifs are, are distributed, um, this is a figure from a paper of a couple of years ago showing that, that the human cell types, each line in here is a different human cell type, had virtually the identical architecture and how these, how these uh, are utilized. You can make this computation over these mouse cell types and you get a very similar looking picture. In fact, it's not just similar, if you superimpose them, uh, they're practically identical. So the global architecture of the human and mouse networks uh, are, are uh, extremely similar. And this also extends to the fine network architecture where I can go into any one of these sort of network motifs and ask what kinds of transcription factors do I find in each location in human and mouse. Uh, and, and you basically, again, find the same thing, that the same regulators like to sit in the same spots in the same kinds of networks between human and mouse. So just kind of wrapping this up and stepping back from the genome, we can see where evolution here has really been acting. You know, we talk about this figure about how much individual DNA bases are conserved, 5%, 10%, whatever, whatever you want. But when we look up at the level of, uh, of footprints, there's about a 20% uh, uh, conservation. We go on average across all cell types. We look at, at TF, the transcription factor connections, there is uh, uh, around 44% of those are conserved. And when we go to, finally, to networks, we see that the human and mouse networks really look uh, uh, the same in many different ways. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and just uh, highlight uh, uh, some great students and fellows um, and uh, uh, computational staff and, and all of our uh, uh, great collaborators that, that help bring the mouse uh, uh, DNAs1 data forward, and obviously uh, NHGRI's funding of the Mouse Encode project. Thank you. So a substantial amount of the mouse and human genomes uh, are comprised of retro elements that certainly move around and can introduce regulatory elements. So how much of the lineage-specific regulatory sequences you're describing are embedded in retroviruses? Yeah, so actually the retro elements are, are really a remarkable story. In, in the human genome, it, it turns out that, that there's a very substantial compartment of hypersensitive sites on retro elements, and they tend to be extremely cell type selective. So actually, Guillaume Bork uh, has a very nice paper 
on this, analyzing it very systematically. Um, and the, uh, but when you look at the mouse and you look at what has happened between um, uh, human and mouse, you have two things. Number one, you see a large number of the innovated sequences but that are different between human and mouse. They do comprise these, uh, these retro elements. So there's two real classes of the new stuff, the stuff that's evolving on kind of the unique DNA and then the retro elements. And the second thing is that, that we see pervasive evidence of the phenomenon of kind of transcription factor hopping in the sense that, that, the, that the binding sites of many, of many types of transcription factors have been disproportionately distributed around the genome through particular classes of uh, of retro elements. Um, so that's actually an extremely important uh, uh, compartment and the source for, of a lot of regulatory diversity. Hey, John, uh, regarding the enhanced repurposing, so do you see any specific pairs of uh, uh, transcription factors and certain tissues, like the linkage? Yeah, so I think that the, the, the issue here is that it appears to be extremely easy for nature to evolve new binding sites and to flip a, the specificity of an element from one tissue type to another, even through the innovation of just a couple of, of, of recognition sites for a lineage regulator or for maybe a different combination of sites. So in other words, th that, that that appears to be a very, very plastic thing. In some cases, we can even identify elements that have a single new binding site that's shown up that's flipped its, that's flipped its tissue. More often, though, the case is that there has been larger scale rearrangement. And so the evolutionary time scale on which that appears to be able to take place is really, really, appears to be really short. And I think, you know, a part of the issue is that we have been you know, we uh, globally thinking for, for many years about regulatory elements as being uh, super engineered, tightly put together things that are really precious, like, you know, digging up uh, diamonds in the mine in South Africa, you know, when in fact these things are being mass produced offshore somewhere. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's yeah. just continuously, uh, 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 you know, being, being produced by evolution. Yeah, somehow I was also thinking of a Chris Glass talk from yesterday. Is it possible, like, one of the TF is conserved and then this new partner and then this new... Uh, so, so what you're getting out there is, is the explanation for the phenomenon, which may seem paradoxical, that I have a single piece of DNA, I know it's the same piece of DNA in human and mouse, because I have enough basis to super confidently oh, say, okay. but in fact, I look and see between human and mouse, and there's like none of the same transcription factors there. And the reason for that is because of cooperativity and nucleosome enforced cooperativity. So you've got, in order to have a piece of regulatory DNA, you have to have your factors, it's gotta get rid of a nucleosome. And what that means is that making a change there is very, very easy compared to forming a new element, which requires lots of other sites to come together. And so what happens is you can lose one, and then you can lose another, a different one, a different one. You lose four or five in a row, it's still the site, the site's there every time, but now you've suddenly rearranged, you've suddenly turned over the entire furniture in the house, while the house is still there. <laughs> Thanks. You, you can't do it, it implies that it occurs sequentially, not a wholesale turnover. Yeah. Oh, oh I'm sorry, the, the question was, uh, uh, do you have to leave something there? So, the, and that's, the, the, so that each time. So the answer is absolutely, because something has to be there, be there to maintain the cooperativity. It's exactly what Chris sort of showed, is the sense that you have these cooperative interactions, but there's still, everybody has to be there in order for that thing to, to happen. One, one last, okay. Well, yeah, we, we should. We, we, you can find me at the uh, afterwards. So. <laughs>